talk about um, the sustainability ethic and, and what I think we need to do. And, and this is going to be a very, very short presentation, or at least I'm going to try to make it short, but I do tend to wax on once I get started. Um, one of the, the primary issues that, that I have, and I was delighted to hear John bring it up this morning, is that we are on this trajectory. We have an energy imperative. The demand for energy is continuing to, to rise. We have a declining availability of cheap fossil fuels. And interestingly, John brought up, uh, this John, brought up fracking. And I just saw in Business Week an article today that said, um, or at least in this past week, that uh, said that, that fracking is already on the decline. You know, the, the well, the, they're, they're forcing these wells to such an extent and there's actually so little gas available that they stick it in, they, they put four times more steel in a fracked well, they pollute the water using millions of gallons of water per well, all this, the, um, I could go on and on, I'm, I'm very much uh, involved in the fracking fight, but um, you know, we're already seeing that phasing out and we're going to see all these rapid fire attempts to find solutions and the energy imperative is really what's pushing us because our energy demand has not declined but our, our available cheap and, and, and uh, safe sources are um, definitely more limited. And then we have a productivity uh, imperative, you know, particularly in the food. And, and what we're finding is that those, those cheap fossil fuels that we were using also to help us produce food are no longer available. That translates also into transportation costs and declining forest health and the catastrophic wildfires. And, uh, particularly for people in the West, uh, that is that's uh, jaw-dropping the uh, the amount of acres that are burned on an annual basis now, and then we have the biomass allure, and it's certainly some of the things that John was pointing out. Um, you know, it's it's ubiquitous. There's a lot of different uses for it. Um, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. Um, it's very exciting that, that there are commercialization possibilities for it. It's portable, transportable. Or, and, and accessible, it's also renewable. And so again, as, as was mentioned this morning, uh, when, when people start flailing around for the fast and easy solution, it's going to be very hard to avoid overuse of biomass and inappropriate uses of biomass and using inappropriate biomass for particular applications. So what do we do to rise to the challenge? Well, first let's take a look at sustainability. I think everybody in this room is very clear on what that definition is, that we're not using resources in a manner that prevents and precludes the, avail the availability and ability of future generations to use those same resources for their benefits. And the, one of the problems is that the way humans define biomass, I mean, this is a very valid and rational explanation. It's a carbon-based material, when sufficiently dry, it can be thermally converted to energy and other byproducts. Very nice. Well, what the, how does nature define biomass? A complex structure of nutrients, moisture, temperature regulators providing shelter, food, homes, and carbon sequestration. Those two definitions are on very opposite ends of the spectrum. And so those of us who are in the biomass related businesses have a big hill to climb because we have to make those two definitions blend, match, and support each other. So when we look at, at biochar, and I, I thank the uh, Pacific Northwest Biochar, uh, particularly John Miedema, um, who I, I've worked with very closely on developing sustainability guidelines. Um, again, it's derived from the, the uh, non-fossilized biocarbon, but the ways that we use it, both at the, the point of use and from, from whence we retrieve it, we reduce the competition for and the use of natural resources and energy, very important in that whole life cycle assessment. We preserve habitats and ecosystems, and I, I would like to say that we could even improve um, habitats and ecosystems, that, that we maintain or improve soil quality, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, avoiding GMOs, and providing community jobs, benefits, and fair labor. And so that's the, that's the attempt to blend those two definitions. And then we start to look at guiding principles. And for me, much of my career has been based on the human relationship to landscapes. And so 
we cannot look at, at biomass use without looking at what people are looking for and what the place or the landscape is looking for. And again, blending those two aspects. So in, in the, the guiding principles and people, when we're looking at the politics, we want just and ethical policies. We want to use a democratic process, be very inclusive and share leadership. Economically, subsidy free. We talk about ourselves being a, a free market society. Oh, please, you know, this is absolutely <laughs> not what's happening. You know, and, and if we were to get rid of, just get rid of subsidies, just for six months, watch how radically our entire society and economic system would shift. I mean, it would be mind boggling because we now subsidize the things that we don't want and that pollute, that are killing us. We are making decisions that are not conducive to life. Carbon markets. Uh, we talked about carbon markets yesterday um, and they are very important, but again, they have to reflect accurate and rational and ethical economic decisions. Um, because if we again try to subsidize, which is what happened to so many of the carbon markets that have tried to get off, the feet, off their feet, is they've been subsidized, subsidizing the very industries that we're trying to encourage to reduce carbon um, or their CO2 and, and greenhouse gas emissions. And so if you subsidize them at the offset, you're not going to get what you're looking for, or at the outset, you're not going to get what you're looking for at the, the tail end. Um, and another area that I think would really, um, could benefit from exploring, and I think biochar has the potential to pay, play a huge role, is in water markets and in nutrient markets. Because there are actually uh, markets available, particularly around the Chesapeake Bay area, is a very successful nutrient trading system. And that's looking at giving farmers, in this case, a, a specific nutrient budget, and they cannot exceed that budget. And if they do, they have to buy the excesses from someone else's budget who isn't using their full budget. Very simple trading scheme, but as long as it's kept really honest, it can, it can be very effective. I think biochar can really play a wonderful role in this because of its ability to retain those nutrients. And so the farmers who now are using very sophisticated methods to analyze the kinds and, and, and intensity of fertilization that they need to stay within their nutrient um, budget, if they're using biochar, they're going to have a lot bigger budget, and then we can start ratcheting over all those budgets downward. Um, and water markets are just starting, but, but I think we're going to see, again, potentially a, a kind of a knee-jerk reaction when we're really put up against the wall with uh, the availability of, of high-quality potable water. And then from the social standpoint, a little humor over there. I, I used to have goats. I used them. Um, they were pack goats, but I also used them for brush control. And uh, so from the social standpoint, you know, people are looking for food security. They want more of their goods coming locally, and they need that because um, just of our, our, um, the, the difficulty in, in having cheap, affordable energy that's also very, uh, very clean and safe for the environment. And people need a fair wage and they need safe, safe work environment. Um, and then we shift to the landscape. You know, what are we doing with our ecosystems and how are we attending to the, the huge um, natural goods and services that nature provides us? Well, there in water, certainly we want no jet net GHG increase very efficient with our water, maintaining the air quality and water quality. Um, soil and energy, we have to get off the, our chemical dependency. It's killing us and we're, we are perpetuating, again, a cycle of death rather than cycles of life, which is really what we're, I think, on this planet to do. Um, improving soils, create and conserve energy and protect wetlands. And there's also another aspect coming in that I, I've not added to this, and I think I really need to, is there's a whole field of study emerging called blue carbon, and it's looking at the, the carbon sequestration values in coastal areas where we can actually be, um, instead of trying to kill the ocean, uh, helping the ocean to become even a, a, a better and more active carbon sponge. And right now, by our... Um, 
dumping too many nutrients into our waterways. We're pro um, proliferating the growth of algae, which is, is killing out seagrasses. And seagrasses are a tremendous carbon sink. And so if we can start incorporating also some, some intelligent blue carbon techniques would be um, highly better off. And then in our relationship with nature, we, we certainly should be enhancing biodiversity, maintaining habitats, enhancing overall productivity, not just productivity that specifically benefits humans, and also avoid land use conversion, which is extremely important. And again, true sustainability means that all of our choices are conducive to life. And I like to say that there are, oh, there's always gray areas. No, there are no gray areas in this particular um, question because we either, make con we either make choices that are conducive to death or we make choices that are conducive to life. So thank you for being here. And insatiable is not sustainable. Mm -hmm.